I'll just share with you a final bit. Um, so the title of the, the title of the research project um, we will be discussing today is um, Inclusive Volunteering, Myth or Reality, which is also known as What the Bloody How Are You Doing Here? is a comparative study of the experiences of Black, Asian, minority ethnic group and white volunteers in four organisations, English Heritage, Citizens Advice, Macmillan and Team London. The research carried out by Dr. Helen Timbrell explores the experiences of volunteers through one-to-one -one interviews. The report shares a range of findings in relation to organization cultures, behaviors, and practices, and makes recommendations for how to improve practice to ensure the volunteer experience is gen generally inclusive. If you would like to ask any questions throughout the session, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be collecting them up and asking um, um, Helen, Ajay, and Annie throughout. Um, and feel free to message us directly as well um, around questions. So I'll hand over to Helen. Thanks, Will. Okay, folks, so I'm gonna use some slides um, and I'm gonna go through them at probably what might feel like quite an alarming pace. And that is because, um, so I'm gonna do the beginning bit really quickly. I'm gonna dwell a bit on the middle bit, which is mostly about the findings. And then I'll probably whip through the end bit. And that's because in conversation with uh, Will and Rhiannon, we feel like the most valuable thing will be for you guys to have a conversation with each other and with me and with Annie, who was part of the project team who oversaw the research and particularly with Hadji, who was one of the volunteers who was um, interviewed as part of the work. So um, if it feels very quick and you start to feel frustrated and think, I haven't got this, we can share the slides. There is a video of Hadji and I being interviewed about the research, which you can watch in your own pace at your leisure on the AVM website um, and you can also just email me and ask for a copy of the full report so that's my little heads up and my kind of rationale for trying not to lecture you for 40 minutes about our research but actually give you enough that we can have a meaningful conversation very conscious that some of you um, ha might have watched the video already and some of you haven't so here come uh, uh, here come some slides except oh can I share my slides Will have you set that up for me to be able to do that? Should be able to, yeah. Hmm, here we go, here we go. Uh, is that working, gang? Can you all see that? Someone nods yes. at me. Yes, you guys are nodding. So um, I guess the first thing to say is the reason it's called, what the bloody hell are you doing here, is because that was um, a sentence that one of the interviewees used to describe how they feel when they turn up for their volunteering duty. And this was a volunteer in the heritage uh, sector actually. So who talked about that even though that's not what people say, it can feel when he turns up to begin his shift that that's what's going through the minds of some of the white volunteers he works alongside. So um, there, this is, remember, this is the quick bit. So there has been a number of pieces of work uh, beginning to explore issues of inclusion and diversity in charities. And my sense was, as someone who's been around the world of volunteering particularly, and, and the heritage sector for a while, was that the experiences of volunteers were particularly underexplored um, and there was a need to hear from volunteers in their own voices. So my sense was that there was, as a project team, we talked a bit about it feels like the sector is slightly angsting about what to do about issues of equality, diversity and, and inclusion, but not really getting on and doing something. So uh, we were interested in research that might support action rather than angst that filled that gap around volunteer experiences being under-researched and provided kind of this sort of qualitative evidence. I had earlier done a piece of work with heads of volunteering in a range of national charities who had suggested that they had very low levels of, their, of confidence in their current volunteers to support work on becoming more inclusive. Heads of volunteering felt that existing volunteers could potentially be the barrier to greater inclusive volunteering. And I also wanted to, to test that out. So we ran this project from June to February in four organisations. Um, English Heritage was one, Macmillan, Citizens Advice and Team London. We used semi-structured interviews uh, that explored the experiences of the volunteers and we interviewed six volunteers in each of those organisations. So it's relatively small scale work. And we did a 50-50 split in most of those organisations. In one, it was uh, four BAME volunteers and, and two white volunteers. And where we could, we tried to pair for gender, age and the type of volunteer role that was being undertaken and how long someone had been a volunteer. So 
in terms of findings, the first thing to say is there was actually loads of really good news. You will not be surprised to hear that universally. There were lots of positive noises about volunteering. Um, and that probably doesn't surprise us because if people don't like volunteering, they tend not to stay. But it was overwhelmingly a positive experience. And people routinely talked about, regardless of their ethnicity, routinely talked about having received a really warm welcome when they joined as a volunteer. Every single one of the volunteers we interviewed in all four organisations said they intended to continue volunteering in those organisations. And for many, including some of the BANE volunteers, issues of ethnicity were considered completely irrelevant to their volunteering experience. What we will go on to talk about is how that wasn't the case for some, but it is important to just bear in mind that, that good news before we get into the rest, I think. So there was a real sense that um, uh, work around equality, diversity and inclusion generally in the charities was considered by volunteers not something that was a priority. It was seen as something that was a luxury that organisations would spend time on when they had a bit more time or a bit more resource. There was also this sense that you didn't need to focus on equality, diversity and inclusion in these organisations because the organisations were already open to everyone. So as we go through these slides, you can see I've included some of the direct quotes from volunteers who were interviewed as part of this work. What we found really clearly was there was little, if any, training on equality, diversity and inclusion being offered to volunteers. But despite that, there were really high levels of awareness amongst the interviewees of the importance of equality, diversity and inclusion, but it just wasn't being discussed. It wasn't something people talked to each other about, received training on. It didn't feel kind of alive in the organisation. And for lots of the white volunteers, there was a particular fear around if they tried to engage in conversations about these issues, they would get it wrong. There was a real worry about using the wrong language, using the wrong words and causing offence if they tried to have conversations about these issues. More... Um, uh, I guess more fundamental, there was often for lots of the white volunteers an inability to, to understand or to comprehend that their experience as a white volunteer wouldn't be universal or wouldn't be shared. So there was an inability to get past the experience that they had personally lived and to think that it could be different for someone who may be um, of a different ethnicity. And we did find experiences of real or perceived racism and that's a, a quote from previous research around issues of, of, of ethnicity and volunteering we found experiences of real and perceived racism um, both from volunteer peers and so this is Nigel uh, we should say that all of the volunteers in the research were, give us, were the given pseudonyms but Nigel talks about knowing when there's an edge with other volunteers about how they talk to you there was also evidence um, of volunteers having experienced racism um, from members of staff within an organisation. So here Nabila talks about a member of staff just generically referring to the ethnics in, um, in a meeting as part of work that she was doing. And Deepit talks about having been on duty and having um, experienced racism from members of the public. And so there were a number of examples of real or perceived racism that the volunteers were able to uh, share with us. One of the things they talked about when reflecting on their experience was how important it was to feel that they were going to fit in to the existing kind of volunteering culture or, or dynamic. So a lot of the BAME volunteers talked about feeling really apprehensive at the start of their experience and described the degree of comfort they got from either knowing or from literally seeing another person of colour or someone like me, as one of them describes it. So Naomi here, a BAME volunteer, talks about the relief that she felt at an event when another volunteer who wasn't white turned up. So there was this real sense of being apprehensive at the start of the experience and deriving comfort from the knowledge that there would be someone else who wasn't white also involved. And then there were some really interesting um, uh, experiences from volunteers around the particular impact that older white women may have on some of them. So, and this is people from two different organisations here talking about a sense that it is particularly older white women who behave in a way or communicate verbally or non-verbally that they are uncomfortable 
volunteering around BAME volunteer peers. And I think that's something really interesting, particularly for the heritage sector to think about when we think about what we know about the demographics of volunteers in the heritage sector. There were a range of strategies that the BAME volunteers had to put in place to respond to the racism that they were experiencing. That might be that they just made light of it, uh, they made jokes about it. It might be that they chose to um, uh, ignore it or ignore those who were responsible for it. There was a kind of degree of normalising of it, a sense of, um, well, this is just life. There isn't anything different about volunteering that I don't experience in my everyday life. And there are quotes there that kind of support those things. There was also um, this really clear sense of, for some of the BAME volunteers, that the way that they responded to real or perceived racism was to make even more effort to be better at the volunteering and to fight back by being better. And I think that language is a real insight into um, the degree of emotion that is tied up in the experience that they are potentially having in the organisation, this sense of having to fight and having to prove that you were at least as good as, if not better, than other volunteers. Um, in terms of kind of um, what we've called here these strategies of avoidance, there was also this sense of um, people avoiding dealing with it, including the volunteers who experienced the racism themselves. And this came partly from a desire not to make other people feel uncomfortable and partly from a recognition that volunteer managers are often really busy and partly from a lack of confidence that those staff or organisational processes would be fit for purpose. And so what you see in these quotes here is BAME volunteers not sharing what's happened, not reporting it, not seeking to invoke organisational processes because either they don't want to make um, uh, members of staff uncomfortable or other volunteers or uncomfortable or because they just don't believe that it will make any difference. And so what you start to see and, and what came through in the interviews was this sense of some of those BAME volunteers really kind of just absorbing those difficult experiences on behalf of the organisation. What we also saw was some BAME volunteers choosing to take on a kind of um, almost a representational role. So you see in the quote in the top right there where Nasir talks about, um, because I'm the only uh, BAME uh, volunteer there, I make up for it if we're in meetings or trainings by asking lots more questions and answering lots more questions. So there's this sense of kind of representing. And then in Betty's quote at the bottom, you see um, an example of a BAME volunteer taking on a support role, feeling responsible for supporting other BAME volunteers when they join the organisation. And for me, what I, I had a really strong sense of in the interviews was that absorbing of those difficult experiences on behalf of the organisation, taking on these representative roles, taking on support roles, kind of cumulatively creates um, a, a, an additional emotional burden and a need for resilience in the volunteering that just doesn't have an equivalent in the experience. And it feels to me that that's something that volunteer managers really need to think about and be alert to. This is the bit where it's going to go even quicker again. So in the report, there are a whole bundle of recommendations about what organisations uh, might want to do about this. And we tried really hard to be pragmatic and not too theoretical. Um, and these may or may not feel right for you. Um, you may or may not feel that we've missed things in here. I'm not going to go through them in detail. But for us, I guess the key thing was having conversations that enable you to start doing this work. So if we say nothing else about uh, the recommendations, sharing the results of this research with volunteers, with volunteer managers, with leaders in your organisation, can help you start to have honest and open dialogues about issues in relation to equality, diversity and inclusion in your organisation. We also talked about when we presented these findings before, that there are clearly ongoing research gaps. This is small scale work. We think it would be useful to do work with a larger sample or more detailed work in, in one organisation. There were some hints around how issues of gender and ethnicity intersect in the volunteering experience, um, both for men and women. And, and I think there's a real need to, to think about how we might explore that. And I am particularly interested in the experiences of people like you. So people who are leading and managing volunteering and trying to work on equality, diversity and inclusion. I'm interested in, in what gets in the way of that, your success or, or challenges in that, 
how is it that we can make more progress and what's happening for the leaders and managers of volunteers that we're asking to do that work and i think there is a real need to look outside of our own organizations and, and the sector that we're probably closest to and think about what we can learn from organizations who are already doing stuff really well so there you go that was the gallop at the beginning gallop at the end maybe a bit slower in the middle um, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I think between Annie, Hadji and I, we're happy to clarify, go back, answer any questions that have come up for you as part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for that, um, get, that gallop through, through, the, through your, your research. And it's, it's, re it's really interesting research. Um, to hear and particularly for, um, getting those those actual counts real experiences I think is important um, to these um, organizations how um, applicable do you think these uh, these findings are to other organizations do you, would you recommend ex more expansive research into for example other organizations working across the sector um, um, in, in, perhaps um, um, sorry Go ahead. If, if, well, if I put my research head on, of course, all good researchers say there's always a need for more research. But my worry is that that's a cop out. And actually, there is enough known, not just from this piece of work, but there is enough known in the sector and in organisations for um, for teams to start doing something about this. So my worry is, and I, what, I, what would feel like a failing, I think, of the work, I don't know what Annie and Hedgie think, would be if all that came from this was people said, oh no, we can't possibly do anything because we must do more research. My sense is we know enough to crack on. And, and actually, if cracking on is simply having these sorts of conversations in your organization, particularly with volunteers, um, who might be different to the, the majority of the volunteer population in whatever way, if all that happens as a first step is starting to have those conversations, you don't need any more research to enable you to, to do that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've got, we've got some comments coming in on the chat. Uh, I got some from Esther. I don't know if you wanted to talk, talk about some, whether you're happy for me just to read from the chat, Esther. Um. I mean, my experience is quite interesting because I only ever I only started heritage volunteering for an organisation because I used to be their volunteer manager. So after I left the organisation, I continued to support them in a voluntary capacity. Um, and my induction was very different from the inductions that I gave out. So I was also working in a team where I'd actually inducted a lot of the team or done training with a lot of the team um, but it did influence how I induct now um, with people who are either marginalized I mean with the entire team but about issues of you know raising comments for example if you heard someone using a racist term or a homophobic term in the organization we treat it exactly the same way in terms of how they would raise that issue with us and also but it's really important to emphasise that it should not be the black volunteer or the lesbian volunteer or the gay volunteer's responsibility to raise that issue and that it's the responsibility of all the volunteers, particularly for that issue you raised of Bain volunteers feeling like they don't want to make people feel awkward about it. Well, actually, they won't if it's one of the white volunteers saying, well, actually, I would never say that, um, maybe use a different term because I think we've moved away from that. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. I think it's um, I think it's a it's a good point to make about um, uh, around those themes. Um, how how have you um in that terms that transition? Did you find it strange going from that volunteer manager into the volunteer role within that, knowing the organisation itself? Maybe. No, but I mean I. I, it wasn't a complicated relationship because I was the reason I wanted to volunteer with them was because I was so passionate about the organisation anyway um, and about those volunteers. Um, there, yeah, um, it wasn't a hard transition. And also, I have never thought about volunteering for a different heritage organisation than that one that I worked for. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. But then, as we're all aware, lots of volunteers volunteer at multiple organisations. So I have got volunteers who who volunteered for me there, who also volunteer at the National Trust 
um, an organisation like that, and we do talk about things like how their induction differs in different organisations around some of these issues. So, for example, I'm curious about the or the number of BAME volunteers that were interviewed who experienced specific things like Islamophobia, because I think that again is a very distinct experience from an experience that a black volunteer or an Asian volunteer might have. So I'd be curious about the breakdown in terms of how many of them were South Asian, how many of them were black, and did they seem to have different answers? Because I do think that that might vary in terms of experience as well. Can I, shall I just ex uh, yeah. respond to that really tactical point? So if you, uh, I can send you, um, I can send anybody a copy of the full report and it lists exactly that breakdown. Uh, so it lists the breakdown um, uh, by ethnicity at a more granular level and also the age and the length of service um, and the gender of each of the volunteers we interviewed. However, remember it's not a big quantitative study. It's six volunteers in each organisation. So we deliberately avoided um, that, uh, attempting to do any kind of quantitative statistical percentage type analysis because it's just, it's not, it's not built for that. But the detail of who we interviewed is in the, in the full report. Great, thank you, Helen. Um, I've got a question from George um, for Hajay. I don't know if you wanted to come in, George. Okay, um, I think it, the question is centres around um, how, how does Hajay feel about being at, about taking on that representative role? Um, is it helpful? Does it get in the way of the original reason you, you volunteer? Well, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the, the original reason for me to volunteer was purely because I'd taken early retirement. I wanted something to do and I wanted to do something that was out of the sort of norm. Instead of volunteering within my own Asian community was to see what other organisations were out there. And um, from that perspective, the first thing that hits you, um, I'm an I'm a Indian, Indian born in England, and I went to the Bradford um, Crown Court, and the first thing that hits you is the fact that um, I'm the only Asian volunteer there. You know, um, Braff Bradford itself is a diverse, diverse city, and the individuals that we're offering that service to um, fifty percent are, are from the BAME community, so that's the first thing that hits you. But when you're actually doing the role itself, you actually put that to one side because you're there to actually um, help through the um, the witness journey. Um, and um, it isn't until the the sort of research that Helen's done that it's actually got me sitting down and thinking about it. And then when you do think about it, you do see that it is out there. I've been in a fortunate position where I'm thick skinned and you know, you, you tend to sort of put it to one side, um, but it is there. The fact that, like I said, I'm the only Asian person there, but because of my background, I sort of use that to actually show that, you know something, I'm actually better than, um, you know, without being big headed, you know, <laughs> you know, some of the other um, volunteer managers that we've got out there, my, my experience leads me to that. You know, and um, but the most difficult thing is, is just to have these conversations. You know, it's it's okay for me to bring the conversation up within the witness service and to talk about um, um, racism, colour, etc., and whatever. But my managers, my team leaders, they won't bring the subject up until, unless I bring it up. So I think I think I think we need to have more openness and to have these sort of discussions. Yes, I, I agree. I think I from um, previously from your AVM um, interview, I, I picked up along some of the comments around how how um, the volunteer um, volunteers were not representative of the community they are within. I think that's something which a lot of museums and heritage organisations also face, and that's a big theme around um, museums as well. I don't know if you wanted to talk a bit about that sort of that um, that difference between the volunteering and the community they're volunteering within. I think I think it's one of them things whereby I think um, there, there are a lot of people that do volunteering, but sometimes I think they feel they, they just don't know enough about the culture that they're coming into. You know, the fact that I throughout my working life, I've you know I've um, I started off as a TV engineer and then became the chief operating officer, so I'm used to dealing with the different types of people. But I think there's there's this myth out there, the fact that you're going into this environment predominantly. Um, um, 
people themselves, um, they don't know a great deal about the witness service. The witness service, I think more, more Asian people know about the witness service now since I've been in there because I shout about it. Prior to that, there's nothing. So it just, you know, it's, and while I do understand the fact that there are certain individuals who would say, well, it's there. If you, if you look for it, you can come and volunteer. But I think, I think we've actually got to the stage there whereby you've actually got good, educated individuals out there. And it's about attracting them and also making them feel part of this particular organization without coming in and feeling that it's, you know, it's, it's perhaps alienated to them. Um, I would actually bring it back to the, uh, in terms of, and I can only go by my own experience at, um, uh, within the witness service. The majority of people are, are from middle class, white, well-educated, white collar, um, you know, and, and even sometimes the way that perhaps they speak, certain individuals from the BM and community may, may, may see that as a, as a, I don't know, they might be intimidated, intimidated by that. So do you, um, do you think there's, had, have you experienced that sort of, um, I, I know we discussed earlier around the uh, perception of lack of time or lack of ability to put effort into um, um, going out and reaching out to new uh, to the community around them. Um, has it, what sort of experiences have you had where people have sort of tried to um, uh, diversify or reach out to different uh, communities, but haven't, but not really put in the, have not, not found that the sort of the work to do it has been there. Well, I think from my own perspective, I was the one who actually saw the actual um, on do it all, all the org, and I actually attended there. Uh, intended for the initial sort of briefing session. But I think the example that I can give you is the fact that um, I think with everything that's going on in the background, there's a tendency that you have to be seen to be doing the right thing. And um, I was asked the question and, um, and my, my response to that was, well, you know, as not a practicing seat, but you could go to the, we've got a number of temples in, um, um, in Bradford, go there and, you know, introduce yourselves. And the response was, um, I've, got, um, I've got a leaflet here, I've got a, I've, I've got a flyer. Can you, would you mind going sticking that up on the notice board? You know, so from my perspective, it was a case of these organizations, you know, they've got trustees, they've got educated people there, they've got people who actually train people within the community to go and sit with them, explain to them what you do. So a lot more could have been done, but, but sometimes it's also, a matter of time, isn't it? You know, individuals are busy, you know, end of the day, you've got your volunteering to do, and then at the same time, you've also, you've then been asked to do something. And, and you know something, no one's an expert at this, and people are very, uh, I, think, I think they're very careful in terms of what they say, how they say, and who they say it to, because they don't want to be seen, seen as racist, or, you know, you've said the wrong thing. Um, and um, and to put the organization into a particular situation where, you know, someone can then use that to say, well, then volunteers are this way inclined. I was just going to build on what you were saying, Hedgie, because so one of the things we found, didn't we, in the research was that there were a number of examples of um, uh, BAME volunteers being, uh, let's just say, beyond frustrated at having been asked by volunteer managers in their organisation, oh, how on earth do I recruit more diverse volunteers? Perhaps you have some good advice for me. Having been given good advice, by those BAME volunteers, which is get out, make connections in the community, invest in building relationships off site, and that not happening. And the process of having invited the advice, appearing to listen to it, but then choosing to ignore it for whatever reason, caused even more frustration in the relationship between the, the volunteers and how they felt about the organization. Then almost as if it, that, that in some cases felt like that was worse than not having asked for the advice in the first place. And I get the thing about time, I get it. I've been a busy Viet volunteer manager. I get the thing about the time. And I think the more we continue with the, the, the kind of, the narrative about we lack time to do this, the more we position work on equality, diversity and inclusion as separate to our core work, rather than it is the core work. And so I think there is something in there for me about the role of volunteer managers and leaders. And, and that's why I'm really curious about um, how well resourced volunteer managers and leaders are, how much support they get, how much um, development support they get to be confident and skilled to go and do that, let alone the resources they get to ensure they have the time to do it. But I, I, I am nervous about colluding with the we don't have time to do it because it positions it as, as separate. Um, yeah. I just, I just, 
I was just going to follow up on that well as well, just to say it's one of those old things, isn't it, that we we as a sector, both a heritage volunteering and a volunteering sector, have been forever banging on about how do we reach into these communities, how do we reach into communities, and when we get the advice of you've got to go into them and start networking and start doing that stuff, we automatically go, yeah, but how do we do that? And how do we how do we make that time or how do we get that link? And actually, the answers are out there for a lot of us. We just haven't got the time or the capacity to do it. And we, uh, I, I might cut out. From? Ali, a really yeah. um, from the citizens as well. So they've actually been in touch with me and I do we'd like you to get involved. This is great, you know something. decision making you can what I experience it's down to the individual so I think there has to be a voice of you know a, a sort of BAME representative that can then sort of filter that through um, um, to the middle management help actually try and promote it down at the middle management level ground level one of the, some of the best conversations that I have are with other volunteers you know where I would start the conversation and the, and, and, and it goes through the whole sort of spectrum and uh, one of the things I, I want to point out this isn't me just having a go because some of my best friends now are white middle-aged women who were shared in this experience so it just goes to show that if you talk it works just on that if you talk it works thing thing point very good I don't mean thing I mean that really good point that you just made had you about if, if you talk it works we found didn't we through the interviews that um so, you know, I would interview people from anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on how much they had to say. And a number of the uh, white interviewees described the process of being interviewed about these issues as um, a, a, it was almost like they went on a journey from slightly bemused as to why we would even be talking about this, because, of course, ethnicity doesn't have any relationship with the volunteering experience to a sense of, oh, hang on. No, maybe it does now. I can see why you might be asking me these things. And actually, I'm starting to feel really uncomfortable. And then a sort of coming to the end of that and going, this has been really helpful because through that discomfort, I have learned quite a lot and it's broadened my perspective. And that, you know, in a sometimes a 45 minute conversation with someone really just reinforced that point that Hadji is making, I think, that the, the value of having a conversation and giving people the time and space to explore something um, was just the, the process of the interviewing itself reinforced how important that can be, I think. Um, uh, I, what, can I answer, I've seen one of the questions pop up about did we do anything about recruitment and so I just thought I would clarify that, Rihanna has given me a thumbs up. Uh, so we specifically did nothing about recruitment and that was a conscious choice because it comes from, um, so I guess that my proposal to the four charities that I did the research with was so much of the conversation about diversity and inclusion or diversity and volunteering focuses on how do we attract a more diverse volunteer workforce and I was much more interested in that isn't the end of the conversation once you've done that what is the experience of volunteers when they join an organization where they might be uh, different in in one way from the majority so we very specifically chose to focus on the experience post recruitment rather than the recruitment process and that was to slightly tackle the assumption that is sometimes implicit, which is that all you have to do is be successful at recruitment. I, I think what the research proves really clearly is recruitment is potentially the, the, the it's certainly the only the first step and it's possibly the easiest bit. Actually, the, the ongoing management of the relationships and an inclusive environment is the bit where a lot of the work lies, I think. Yeah, I know. I completely agree. I think um, getting a lot of comments around time and stuff, and there's some really interesting comments coming from the chat around that theme, especially around um, 
um, the idea that the use, like the use of the term time is actually, it's actually hiding and masking a lot more about the actual culture of that organization where that time is being devalued and that actual attitude towards um, recruiting and reach out to, and create a more exclusive volunteering experience is not really as valued as it perhaps might be um, said to be. And I think it's um, really interesting. I think um, Annie um, was talking about how in the previous um, talk with us about the transfer of volunteering into um, HR at English Heritage and how that change perhaps could change the relationship. I don't know if you wanted to um, come into that conversation about that change. Yeah, so one of the things we've talked about and, and that Helen quite often drives forwards is that, that quite often it feels, and I've mentioned it in the comments as well just now, because it, quite often it feels like it's our responsibility as volunteer managers to drive this work. But how are we working with our HR colleagues to ensure that this is driven organisationally and strategically, um, regardless as to the size of your organisation, how many sites you've got or anything like that, it, that, that needs to sit with more than just volunteering. Um, and it needs to be a broader spectrum of how you look at your um people across the board it's not just about volunteers volunteers are not just the, the only solution um, and i think the other thing that's, that's really important in that is about and i promised myself i wouldn't start talking about this but i'm gonna have to and um, <laughs> one of the things that i think is really important right now is the conversations that are going to start coming up and have started coming up in some of our organizations about um the stories that we are telling in our heritage organizations and that's really, really important because if we don't make ourselves welcoming and open to people that want that want to come and visit us, we're not going to attract the volunteers or the staff that want to work for us or volunteer for us. And I think that that's going to have to become even more than ever now a really important part of the discussions that we're having as a sector. I'm going to show up now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think um, went off, we went on a total tangent about HR though, so I can answer that a bit more if you want. <laughs> I, I think is it a really I think English heritage is an interesting opportunity because of the relatively new nature of the organization and with your uh, volunteer programs rapidly expanding there's an opportunity to embed it within your regular practice I don't know if you've started looking into how to apply refining some report or what you what you think you could do yeah we we've, we've started to have the conversations and we're actually um so one of the things that we are doing as an organization is we are writing and we've never had an equality and diver equality diversity and inclusion strategy before now so we're actually in the process of writing that and we're using this research as part of that and um, unfortunately covid has put a scupper on that because most of our staff are actually on furlough at the moment and we don't have very many volunteers around but um that will be a piece of work that's picked up as a matter of really real importance it's been recognized by our senior management team as a real piece of important work so the strategy will touch on all all elements of the organization um, and we're working with um, a consultant, hopefully, going forward to continue doing that work as well. Can Brilliant. I just Thank you. on the HR point that um, Annie uh, was making? Because I think, um, so one of the other things that came out of the uh, research, and Hadji and Annie um, comment on this, if, you, if you've got more to add, was um, how important the demographic of the staff in the organisation were for how people felt about their volunteering experience. So lots of the BAME volunteers talked about how it feels to be in an organisation where pretty much all of the staff around you are terribly nice white middle class women of a certain age. Um, and, uh, and for me that was a really tangible example of why volunteering and HR need to work together on these things. Volunteering isn't happening in a bubble. The volunteering experience that people have is impacted by the staff that they are working around. And when those staff tend to be of a particular demographic, you know, and I'm it, I'm probably I'm probably on the old end of it, but I am I am it. I am one of those white middle class women of a I was at one point of the sort of age that they're talking about. That makes a difference to the volunteering experience and hearing that really explicitly you know, uh, uh, unsolicited, we weren't asking people particularly about that, it emerged through the qualitative process, I think is another reason why thinking about the, the people complement in the organisation and, and inclusive cultures is the, is the win rather than how do we recruit more diverse volunteers. Um, and so recruitment and induction focus isn't wrong, but my worry is that that's, when organi that's where organisations stop. We've recruited and we've inducted, tick, and it's, it's a much more holistic approach yeah and the point the point that richard and vanessa have made in the chat is really important is that 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 quite often is the place that we're measuring and vanessa said it is because that's historically where our funders have looked 
and that's where the pressure that's where the the real um not pressure but where we put the force in order to make sure that we're recording those numbers because it's something we have to do um, and it's maybe where we can get a little bit more administrative support to do that because we have to do it for the funders whereas actually we need to turn on its head a little bit and i think in terms of measures more generally within the sector we need to turn all of that on its head a little bit more and start to think about what the meaningful is what what's meaningful behind what we're doing and why we do it why we do that measure in the first place Great, thank you. And I think um, and we're coming close to 45 minutes now, so I don't know if you wanted mm. to um, just um, draw us to a close, Helen. Uh, I probably said way too much. Hadji, do you want to draw us to a close? <laughs> what, what message would you want to leave all these lovely, shiny volunteer leaders and managers with? Well, well from my perspective, I think, I think the volunteering experience itself is good. I think it's good for individuals who are just coming into the actual workforce. Um, but going back to my point i think the more conversations we have like, like this i think the better the better it, it, it can become and i think the most important thing is the fact that once we get this resolved it isn't about extra time because it, beco it, it, it becomes part of life it becomes like when you wake up and you brush your teeth and you, and you wash your face you won't have to spend a specific time on it you know what i mean it becomes part of the, your normal day-to-day -day routine Brilliant. Thank you, Hadji. And I think I just just um, just before we go, I just want to highlight there's a couple of other events going on in the next few days. We've got London Heritage Volunteering Group. They have an event in um, tomorrow. There'll be an Eventbrite link already in the chat. And there's also Esther's um, podcast also dealing with topics such as this as well. So definitely go and have a look at that as well. Um, and so thank you for everyone. Thank you, Haji. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, Helen, for coming today. It's been a really informative talk. And I, I personally really enjoyed it. I think everyone else has. And, and I think it's great. As you said, Haji, it's important to have these conversations and actually take the time to listen. And I think that reflects a lot of the issue, a lot of the discussions today about recognizing that the time to actually work on these projects and value how important they are are important to how we move forward in the future. So thank you. Um.